Okay. Aside from our Stella academic programs, and we offer degree programs ranging from um, everywhere from um, liberal arts courses in English and math, I mean, I'm sorry, in English and social sciences and the um, theater arts to engineering and technology to journalism and communications to um, the sciences like biology, chemistry, physics, um, pre-med, pre-dental studies, pharmaceutical sciences. We have a degree program in pharmacy as well, nursing. In addition to our stellar academic programs, we also have what we call added value experiences that you might not find at other institutions, such as we have an equestrian program that allows our students to learn everything there is to know about horses. Um, and we also have a sailing program. You might not find that at many institutions because of our location. We are surrounded by water on three sides, and so we take advantage of having that kind of opportunity. So consider some of the added value experiences that are different and unique from other institutions when you think about Hampton. Our um, graduation rate for, we measure graduation over a six year period, and our graduation rate is 54%. Um, the next question is, um, when do you have to declare a major? Students have to complete courses through. Um, actually, it's 90 credit hours before you actually have to declare a major, but most students will declare at the end of their first year of studies when they will have about 24 um, to 30 credit hours. Uh, coming into the university, you have the option of being undecided and that way you can do some major exploration to find out what your strengths are, what the market is going to be like when you graduate. And so there's not a lot of pressure to declare, but to come in and uh, most of our students will take general education courses to start out with. These are courses that are uh, similar to what you may have been taking in high school to include English and math and social studies and sciences and natural sciences. Um, However, once you go into your major course of study, you will focus primarily on that particular area. The next question or the last questions are how many undergraduate students? Oh, okay, I covered that one already. I hope I have not gone over my time. But again, I thank you for the opportunity and I welcome your questions um, at the end of the presentation. Ms. Boyd, we thank you so much. We can tell your excitement about your H. BCU Hampton University. Our next speaker will be Dr. Maurice Farrell. Good. Dr. Farrell. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here today. Um, a big shout out to Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated for the invitation, specifically Taffney DeShazer for inviting me to come and chat a little bit today. Uh, let me be real uh, transparent. I am not a college admissions person, um, so this information was coached and given to me by our admissions person. So please, to all of my colleagues that are admission professionals and experts, please bear with me as we go through the process. Um, I would like to say that it is always a great day to be a Tar Heel, um, and today is also a great day to be a Tar Heel. I'm representing the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill where we are the nation's oldest public university, oldest state public university. We are located in Chapel Hill, North Carolina on 729 acres. It is an amazing place where we house two of the oldest state university buildings. Um, we look at our class sizes as something that can be of a challenge. Um, in our gen ed classes, you can have anywhere from 100 to 500 students enrolled in one class. However, when you get down into what they call discussion groups, you will notice that those class sizes run roughly between 10 to 35 students. Um, labs uh, are generally 22%. 22% of those labs are ranging roughly from 20 to 29 students. So our lab environments are a little bit more intimate. Um, as you progress through your majors, after you get out of your general education classes, you will notice that the class sizes will shrink. And so when you get into that third and fourth year, you will notice that class sizes will be roughly 50 students per class. Um, what sets apart our university from other universities and all these are great universities that are represented here today. Uh, one of the things that I think that sets us apart is that we are a major R1 or research one university. We have a worldwide reputation for vital teaching, 
cutting edge research, distinguished public service, and a prestigious academic and athletic programs. We simply put, we get it done on every aspect. We get it done in the classroom and on the field and everybody loves wearing that Carolina blue. Uh, so I'm, I'm super excited about that. Uh, what is our four-year graduation rate? Uh, we graduate 84.2% uh, of those individuals in four years, 84.2%. You have to declare your major at the end of your sophomore year. And we actually have an admission of undergrad students um, of about 19,355 students. 60% of that enrollment consists of women. 40% are made up of men. Um, the white portion of our student body makes up about 61.2%, while Hispanic and African-Americans combined for 17.3% of the student body population. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. Uh, uh, Motley, the reason that you put that four letter word in the chat, we got problems, we got problems. We're not gonna even mention that school in Durham. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking about NC Central. I'm not talking about NC Central. I'm talking about that four letter word. Y'all need to erase that out of your vocabulary. Eh? <laughs> Thank you all again for allowing me to be a part of this amazing session. Dr. Farrell, they sent good representation. You may not be an admissions counselor or specialist, but you certainly provided some much needed information in addition to what we ask for. And those are points that we know most of the students would want to know. I know that there was a question in the chat, but I guess we'll wait until later. And it was regarding whether or not you need to declare a major earlier, I think, in order to apply for certain scholarships. But I think we'll get to that later. And I believe that was going to be for you, Dr. Farrell. All right, our third panelist is going to be Ms. Mariah Walker, the admissions counselor at Averett University. Good afternoon. I first want to say thank you um, for having me to present my alma mater to you. Um, at Avery University, what sets us apart and maybe why you want to come to Avery, we allow access from the moment that you apply until the day that you graduate. So coming through the door, if you do not know what major you want to declare, that is okay. Um, but knowing ahead of time is more than better because coming in, if you know your major you want to declare, you get to go ahead and start taking your major classes your first year. So we give you a mix of your gen ed classes as well as your major classes. Um, your class ratio class sizes are anywhere from 21 students in your largest classes like your English classes or your math classes, but your small major classes can be anywhere from three to six students. So you're able to build that relationship with your professor um, for after when you graduate, you may need references or if you just need help going over your curriculum and what they are lecturing and at the time. Our graduation rate um, is at a 45%. That does not include our transfer students. So we do know that it can be better. And that is over just the four years. Um, let's see, what's the next question? Declare major. Undergraduate students we have um, on campus is about 965 students. So we are a small institution. Um, so given that we are small, you are still able to um, like I said, build those relationships with your professors, with your classmates, and um, with different personnel on campus. And one of the questions was, what do we offer that sets us apart? Um, just like um, my other panelists, um, Ham Ms. Hampton, she said that they have a question. We too have a question at Avery University. So we have about 45 different horses on campus, as well as we teach um, young individuals how to fly airplanes. So we do do aeronautics. So if your dreams are to become a pilot one day, you definitely can do that at Averitt. And we do have athletics. We are a division three school, but if you want to fly the plane and play some football from time to time, you can definitely do both. Um, we make sure that we make it happen because at Averitt, we believe in one team and we believe in making sure that the students are successful from the very moment that they enter through the door. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and any questions later on, I will definitely discuss and answer. 
Ms. Walker, thank you so much for your presentation. And these questions, though they may seem lengthy, are questions that students should really consider when they're determining where they want to go. And I know that class size as well as the school size itself does matter. Our next panelist is going to be Mr. Freddie Williams, who is an administrative of, at, admissions official at Alabama State University. Mr. Williams. So at Alabama State, you're not just a number. Spring, fall, or be it summer. You see, to us, you are so much more. So welcome to our campus. Feel free to explore. You will adore our campus scene because we have so many things. You see, the reason why I brag and boast is because when Alabama State teaches class, the world takes note. Greetings, greetings, greetings. My name is Freddie Williams Jr. and I serve as one of three interim assistant vice president for student affairs, enrollment management and director and of admissions and recruitment here at the Alabama State University. On behalf of our board of trustees, our president, Dr. Quentin T. Ross Jr., welcome virtually to our beautiful campus located here in Montgomery, Alabama. Alabama State University was founded in 1867 by nine free slaves. They were known as the, uh, uh, we call them the uh, Marion Nine, as the Lincoln School uh, in Marion, Alabama, and we certainly involved into Alabama State University. We have about 60 different undergraduate programs to choose from, from accounting to theater art and almost everything in between. Uh, the first question is, why should you attend Alabama State? Uh, in addition to our excellent programs, uh, we take pride in our academic support systems where we offer tutoring, that, uh, tutoring labs that are staffed by employees and uh, student peer tutors. Uh, and our family atmosphere is also uh, one of the things that I like to brag about. Um, I like to describe ASU campus life as lit, L-I-T, live, interactive, and transformative. And as an almost three-time graduate of Alabama State University, I am a true example of how this place can transform and change you. Uh, ASU also has vibrant activities around our athletic programs, including a three classic football games, our Labor Day Classic here in Montgomery, the Magic City Classic that we play in Birmingham, Alabama, and the granddaddy of the mall, the Turkey Day Classic featuring Alabama State and once again, Tuskegee uh, University, and we are proud of that. In terms of our average class sizes, we have about 15 to 1 when you first enter the university, and as stated previously by some of our other uh, panelists. Uh, typically, once you get into your major, those class sizes tend to get a lot smaller. Uh, the thing that I like most and encourage people uh, is the family atmosphere that you'll find here at Alabama State University. Uh, our graduation rate over six years, we measure at a six years, about 26 percent. Uh, and do you have to declare a major or win? Typically around the sophomore year, uh, the sooner the better, because typically some uh, programs have direct admissions where you can go directly into that program. If not, we house you in what we call our university college until you actually choose a major. Uh, and at that point, you can uh, go ahead and transition into your program. Uh, in regards to our campus size, we have about 4,500 students or so. So again, we are a smaller HBCU, uh, but the good news about the smallness is we are big enough to uh, we actually was uh, big enough to know you, but small enough to grow you. And so we appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel. We thank everyone for uh, the invitation. I look forward to answering any questions that you all may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Williams, I'm not sure what to say. We see that not only are you in admissions, you're also in recruitment. You're also a poet. And it appears that you are just like me, a lifelong learner of learning. And we do have a sorority member. Uh, I don't know that she's on our call right now, but she proudly boasts of Alabama State University. All right, thank you again. Our next speaker uh, panelist will be Ms. Morgan Belcher. Ms. Belcher is from, is the Assistant Director of Admissions at Stevenson University, Ms. Belcher. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to Alpha Kappa Alpha for inviting me. Um, and I'm really excited to share a little bit more about Stevenson with everyone who is here today. Um, Stevenson, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we are a small private liberal arts university in Owings Mills, Maryland, which is about half an hour northwest of Baltimore City. Um, so we are in the suburbs of Baltimore County. Um, and again, we are pretty small. We'll get to the numbers and all of that kind of stuff when we get to uh, 
um, the size of our undergraduate population, um, but that is a really big feature of who we are. So I'll make sure to talk about that a lot. Um, a little bit about me. I am, um, as was mentioned before, um, one of our assistant directors of admissions at Stevenson. I've been at uh, Stevenson since 2018. Uh, I graduated from college in 2017 with my bachelor's and I'm currently getting my master's degree in PR at Georgetown. Um, so I am so excited to share a little bit more about my own institution, but I have lots of love for all the institutions that are with us today. I also uh, graduated from Christopher Newport University, which is not near Hampton, but um, in the same kind of area in Newport News. Um, so I'm glad that we have um, a alumni chapter from that area on the call as well today. So anyway, um, a little bit about Stevenson. I mentioned that we are small. That's a huge reason why I believe students should attend Stevenson. The location is wonderful as well. Again, we are pretty close to um, Baltimore being about half an hour away, closer to 45 minutes away from our state's capital of Annapolis, an hour away from Washington DC. So we are right in the middle of everything. Uh, we are incredibly, incredibly hands-on. And we also have student success coaching, uh, which is basically a a little bit more of a hands-on academic advisor for our first year freshman students. So you really never have to decide, um, you know, your classes or anything like that on your own all throughout your first year, but your student success coaches also check in on you to make sure that you're doing well outside of the classroom, you're staying in touch with your family, you're getting involved, and they also have um, something called our Finish and Four campaign where they actually have all of our first year students create a full four year, eight semester schedule. So they know exactly what they're taking and when. So they're not leaving it up to chance their senior year to figure out, oh, am I going to be graduating on time? That is not something that, you know, we just leave up to chance with that program. Um, in terms of our average class size, again, we are a pretty small institution. Our average class size is 17 students. Our smallest class, once you get into the upper levels of your major is gonna be lower than 10. Um, and our largest class we have on campus is under 30. So close to 28, 29 students. Uh, we don't have any lecture halls. That's just not what we're about. We really want the opportunity for our students to be in that small learning environment. Um, in terms of things that set Stevenson apart from other universities, we are incredibly intentional about career preparation. Um, so 100% of our majors require that you have any sort of out of the classroom, hands-on career opportunities. So that's internships, research, capstone experiences, student teaching for our education majors, uh, clinicals at Johns Hopkins for our nursing majors. But then on the other hand, uh, you also are provided those opportunities throughout your time at Stevenson. And most of our students will graduate with more than one. Um, our top four majors are nursing, business administration, biology, and criminal justice. And we do have a direct admit four-year nursing program. So if you are interested in nursing, that's another thing that kind of sets us apart. In terms of our graduation rate, we also report a six-year graduation rate, which is 62%. Um, and then, oh, when do you have to declare a major? Kind of similar to a lot of other universities, you can be a deciding major um, until about the second semester of your sophomore years when we would prefer you to kind of have a choice uh, by. And then lastly, how many undergraduate students attend? Again, we are pretty small. So we have just over 2,700 um, undergraduate students on our campus, although we do have a pretty small um, graduate population as well. So again, uh, super excited to be here and to hear from the other representatives that are here. And thank you guys so much for being here. Ms. Belcher, again, thank you for your presentation on your school and with what makes it unique to us. I'm learning a lot today. I don't know what the students are getting from it, but I'm learning a lot that I do wish I had known. Our next speaker is Dr. Giovanni Felix. And Dr. Giovanni Felix is the Associate Vice Chancellor at North Carolina Central University. Dr. Felix. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Giovanni Felix. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the lovely ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated for inviting me. Uh, I am a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha, so anything I ever do for my sisters, I'm always here for it. So thank you so much for inviting me and having me here. Um, first, I want to say, like Dr. Farrell, uh, I am not an admissions person. Uh, I am student affairs, and student affairs is everything other than academics. So to answer the very first question of why you should attend, we are very, very student-centered. There's a Latin term called in parentis locus, which means in local parentis, which means in lieu of parents. So we take it very seriously that when our students come, that we act as if we are their parents and that we take care of them in every single possible way that we can. So um, that's been very apparent since COVID. We've actually um, really have managed to 
uh, stay with all of our students to have all the protocols and everything in place uh, to make sure that everyone's been safe. And we've seen the great benefits of it with our students in the whole past year. Um, regarding to our particular school, one of the things that I love about North Carolina Central University is location. We're right in the research triangle in North Carolina. So we have the pleasure of being next to our neighbors at UNC in Chapel Hill and also uh, with Raleigh being right there. There are a lot of resources to where a lot of our students, the ones coming from out of state, the ones who stay in state, tend to stay around um, our school after they graduate because there's so many different resources. So resource rich is a very big reason why um, our school is very successful and why we think students should come. Our average class size is about 21 students um, the most. So the lower end, as you get further into your major, you'll see classes could be four or five, depending if it's a capstone, if it's a specific course. We have about 81 uh, majors in, uh, sorry, 81 different degrees um, that are offered at the institution through 13 different colleges. One of our high points is our biomanufacturing research institute and technology enterprise called Bright, which basically uh, founded in 2008. It's a state of art facility that's home to 40 scientists whose research and training efforts contribute to the workforce development for the biomanufacturing and pharmaceuticals industries in North Carolina. So that's a really big thing for us. Um, our four year graduation rate is 27 percent, but our fifth year graduation jumps up to uh, 52. So a lot of our students typically graduate within uh, four to five years. Um, our enrollment size, we have about 6,000 undergraduate with an additional 2,000 graduate students altogether. Um, and our retention rate hovers somewhere between 78 to 85 percent. Um, when you get to dec declare a major, Obviously, the earlier the better. We do have some majors that you may want to try to uh, do as soon as possible based on if it's a uh, STEM-based major. You probably, to stay on track, we need to uh, kind of probably declare that early on, uh, like within the first year. But for the most, for like our College of Arts and other majors, you have until the end of your sophomore year to really completely declare um, a major. Uh, and that's what I have so far. Just to give you a little side note about myself. so. One of the things is while I am representing North Carolina Central University, I want to make it very clear that my biggest and overall mission is to support any student who wants to go to any school or institution. And that's really huge. So um, I just wanted to make sure that um, I state that because some of my answers will be some overarching uh, things about different schools that I've uh, worked at. So thank you. Dr. Felix, we thank you for your presentation, and I do agree right along with you. Let's support our students to get them where they can be. So we're going to support all of the institutions here. Our, our next speaker is Mr. Jordan Fields from the University of Maryland College Park, and he is an admissions counselor. Mr. Fields. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me today for this great presentation. Um, First and foremost, so my name is Jordan Fields. I'm an admissions counselor at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, so what can I say about Maryland? Um, you know, University of Maryland College Park, you know, we're the, we're the flagship institution in the state of Maryland. So we are a very big school. We're looking at around 30,000 undergraduate students um, with wow. a huge following um, with our sports program as well. But first and foremost, what we really strive to do, we are a big research institution. So there's going to be a lot of great hands-on experience that students will, will, will be able to involve themselves in on campus as well as off campus. Um, of course, we are located in College Park, Maryland. So we're about probably 15 to 20 minutes outside of DC, depending on what part you're actually going to. So very close, very easy, very, um, very maneuverable to actually get there. Um, and accessibility is great. Uh, one of the great things that we really do is we want our students to be great. Uh, we want our students to be fearless. We want them to go after that. Uh, a fun fact about us is we are ranked 10th in uh, the US News and World Reports for students of best entrepreneurship um, in the magazine. So students that come to Maryland, you know, they're, they're taking forth their initiatives and taking forth of what they are passionate about and bringing them into the world and going and moving forward with them and moving out. So um, if that's something that interests you and you want to be, you know, you want to be your own boss, be an entrepreneur, uh, we have a great program and we have a, a lot of resources and stability in that realm. In regards to our class sizes, so they can be as little as 35 students with up to 300 students. So your, gener your general education classes are going to be a little bit bigger, um, you know, with your bio classes that are going to be shared amongst eight different majors. So, okay, so your general education classes will be bigger, um, where you'll have a some smaller classes as you begin to get deeper into your undergraduate and uh, pathway. 
Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, our graduation rate is around 84%. So um, that can be a little bit of skew of skewness there because we do have a lot of students that do continue into a five-year programs. Um, so they kind of stay with our, with our institution for a little bit longer as opposed to graduating in that traditional four years since. We do have over 90 majors and 70 different minors. So there's plenty to choose from. Um, and you have two years before you have to declare your major. Uh, we set those parameters in line so that students don't fall behind on their uh, undergraduate curriculum and so that they can still graduate on time and still have that best path that is set out for them. Um, and I believe that is all I have. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that we have at conclusion of this presentation. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you also, Mr. Fields. I have been I have been very impressed by our panelists and with the questions that we provided that we wanted them to speak on. So what I'm going to do now is I want all of you all to participate in at least one or two of these questions. So I'm going to ask the various members of the panel and when you have a response, you can go ahead and just just jump in. So our first question is, what are the common mistakes that students make when applying to college? And so one of our panelists will jump in. I think I'll I that one. <laughs> you want to go, Brother Felix? I was just going to say just real quickly that um, one, of the things that pop, one of the things that pops in my head is um, just realizing uh, that especially if it's away from home, right? That you are, you're getting married and having a commitment to that city also. Mm -hmm. uh, people just think about the school, but sometimes you gotta figure out the fit. I mean, is it, you know, you, do you feel comfortable in that city, in that state, in that place? Because you're gonna be living there for four years, and you're gonna be part of that community. So that's something that um, I always push if you can to make sure you do a college visit, do a college tour, and really try to figure out what that feel is. So that's the, a quick answer, I think, uh, something that people don't really think about in terms of mistakes of, of applying and actually um, picking a school. I can think, I um, yeah, Mr. Williams, I think you would have jumped in. I think I saw Ms. Walker as well. You all can answer that as well. Okay, well, one of the things, and I agree uh, with Ms. Felix, uh, is it Dr. Felix or Mr. Felix? The way it's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree with them. One thing that I always caution students because they want to choose a, a, a university based on where their friends are going. Uh, I agree that having a fit and a feel for the university that best fits, best fits you is the number one thing that I see that a lot of students make the mistake of trying to follow their friends. And then secondly, is being last minute. Uh, we want to just encourage all students to apply early. Uh, we have more scholarships in the beginning than we do at the last minute. We have more opportunities for them in, uh, the earlier the day apply. So applying early would, uh, would be certainly something we would encourage them to do. I too was going to the same exact things they just said was <laughs> visiting because you never know if you're going to like if you're not mm -hmm. visit and applying for scholarships. A lot of scholarship money goes unclaimed because people simply will not ask Hey, do you have a scholarship or they don't want to do the work to get it? But in order to get the money, if you just have to write a simple essay, and I encourage all of my students to go ahead and maybe write two essays in the beginning, maybe why you want to go to college and why you want to major in what you want to major in. So when it's time to do those scholarships, you already have them done. You can do 200 one day, 50 the next day, 30 the next day, but you're trying to get that money that is going unclaimed. So scholarships and visiting are the main two things that I see um, as far as being an admissions counselor. Very good. Now, question number two, and it kind of leads up to what you were saying. This next question, what makes an essay stand out or makes it compelling? I'd like to jump in on that one. Okay. Um, also, if I could just quickly go back to that first question, because I really wanted to add something that had not been said, but touched on, and that was with the application process, it is very important that you apply early um, because of the opportunities that are available to you uh, as an early applicant, but to also during the application process, make sure that you are submitting all of your credentials in a timely manner, because it is one thing to submit the application, but 
if you wait to submit your essay or your letter of recommendation or your transcript, it delays the process and creates uh, more problems for you down the line. So it's always a good idea to submit all of your credentials at one time so that when the offices are reviewing them, they have the information in front of them that they need. And um, with respect to your second question, which was, tell me again, it was because I want to jump in on that one. What makes an essay stand oh, out or what makes it compelling? With re regards to what makes an essay stand out, one that is well written, it is extremely important that students um, have that second eye to take a look at an essay. Uh, one of the, my pet peeves is when they have misspelled words. Um, they have not done a, a spell check or had that second eye um, that they have a well thought out topic, uh, whether it's one that's provided for them or one that they provide on their own. But um, they need to understand that many colleges, especially selective ones, are taking the time to really read the essays because it tells us about you, who you are, and whether or not you're going to be a good fit for our institution. And so make sure that you take the time to proof your essay because I tell you that the, my biggest pet peeve is those students who are applying to multiple schools. And when you put in your essay, you know, one of the reasons why I want to ten, attend Howard University and um, I am at Hampton, you know, <laughs> you create um, some challenges for me because it just tells me that you didn't care enough about the process to pay attention to those kinds of details that are very important. Um, the more um, um, descriptive you can be in your essays, particularly when you're talking about yourselves, the better. Uh, but make sure you work with you may, perhaps your English teacher or someone who has a command of the English language um, when you are working on, and submitting your essays because people are not putting enough emphasis on writing skills because that's what we're looking at as well, whether or not that student has strong writing skills. And so pay attention and uh, make sure that you have a second eye. Okay, very good. Anyone else on that one? Can I jump in for a quick second? Yes, certainly. Uh, so I had, a, I had the pleasure this past semester of reading some of these essays. And let me say it's really important um, to make sure that you are answering all the questions or the prompts of the essay. So make sure that you are paying attention to that. If there is a word limit, do not go over the word limit. I'm gonna say that again for everybody on the other side of my Zoom screen. Do not go over the word limit because it, I know at UNC, they automatically kick those out. So they already, you already have uh, an amazing academic career. You have this great, wonderful GPA. You have this amazing ACT, SAT score. What the essay does, what the essay will do for you is bring personality to the grade. It will actually put a face to the statistic. And so what you want to do is make sure that you are making a compelling story of why you should be admitted to this university. You are, you are sharing that you have resiliency, that you have the ability to go to the next level, and universities are looking for those individuals that will continue on to tra the tradition of academic excellence. So think about that as you are writing your essay to put your face, your footprint, your fingerprint on who you are and the grades and the scores that you have accumulated. And I think these have all been excellent points. And I hope that our young people on the call right now, even though they may not be seniors, that we might have sophomores and juniors, those are things that you need to consider moving forward when you're writing papers and essays for your classes. Question three, COVID-19, it's affected our lives in many ways. But how has it affected the college admissions process? What assurances are you giving students that they will receive an adequate education during the pandemic, even if your institution remains remote or hybrid? And I know you've had to do a number of things to make the adjustments. So who wants to respond to that? I'll hop on this one. Um, so of course maryland is a huge school so there's a you know there's a lot of things that are regulated um of course being funded by the state so we have to follow state regulations first and foremost and make sure safety 
um, is good to go before we can proceed with any anything forward. But um, I will definitely say COVID is, you know, it has affected affected our institution greatly, as it, I can imagine for multiple other institutions as well, along with people. Um, but students have still been successful. Students have still been able to be in this model of being virtual as well as um, having some courses that have been in person. So we've had a little bit of a hybrid model from this past fall um, and into the spring. The plan in the fall is to, of course, some transition into a full capacity, um, but we'll see how that works out and how that pans out over the course of this, these ne this next month or two. So um, students have done well. Uh, students have been able to be become acclimated, have been on campus, um, and it's been it's been good. It's definitely been a transition. And it's been a change as we kind of expect that it would be. Um, but students have been have been able to adjust. Have been able to adjust well. Uh, Miss Belcher, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, um, definitely wanted to echo everything that Jordan said. That was totally spot on. I think a lot of us um, are transitioning back to being completely in person this fall. So it won't necessarily affect our day-to-day -day in terms of classes as much as it had um, in this past academic year. But the one other thing I wanted to touch on is that um, Stevenson, along with a lot of other institutions, because of COVID-19 decided this past academic year to change our testing policy. Um, so whereas SAT or ACT requirements uh, were in place before, this year, um, some institutions have been test optional. Stevenson has actually been test blind. Um, the difference being that test optional uh, institutions may still um, see your uh, your test scores and you know if you have them that's great if you don't then that's fine um, for us we just don't look at them at all so you know it won't penalize you it won't necessarily you know boost you in any sort of way we just don't consider them um, when you're looking at scholarships or just admission to the university at all. So definitely, um, you know, look at testing requirements. A lot of colleges have reinstated them. A lot of them, like our, us, have kept them, you know, test blind or test optional. So definitely stay updated with our websites on that. Also, Dr. Bowers, as it relates to the application process, um, I think that a lot of what we found was a lot of students and parents were struggling with um, the portion of the application that asked about clubs and organizations that you've been a part of, your community involvement. And when COVID hit and students lost the opportunity to participate, they wondered how it was going to affect their application. And so um, I encouraged students um, to look for different kinds of opportunities. Uh, most of them got very involved in virtual tutorial programs. Um, there are different kinds of uh, virtual community service activities that they became involved in. And so we, we started looking for how creative the students got with respect to um, not being able to showcase what their plans were, what their intentions had been in terms of um, outside um, clubs and organizations and that kind of involvement. Um, and so I wanted to put that out there to say, don't panic because you feel like you haven't had an opportunity to, um, to, to enhance that particular aspect of the college admissions process, but to look for those creative ways that you can, can stay involved and assist um, in different areas of, of your life and in your community. Again, I think that was an excellent point because we know that their involvement in various clubs, organizations, and sports and whatever is very important to help them maintain that sense of normalcy. Anyone, any other comments on that one? Uh, I'd like to add to okay. that uh, one of the things that we've that I'm seeing now, because um, we actually did a study, of, uh, we went test optional because of COVID as well, like most universities did. Um, that may be something that we'll continue on in the future. Uh, because one of the things that we see is that there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the students that came in without test scores versus the ones who actually had test scores. And so you kind of see a big push around the nation where people may start going test optional going forward, just specifically look at the uh, student's academic record, um, which may be a good thing for our students because some of our students don't test well and we recognize that, uh, but now they have an opportunity to be able to come into the university uh, just looking specifically at what they did uh, from an academic standpoint. Okay. 
were you about to respond? Well, I was going to address the adequate education part of this um, this question, and I like how it's phrased because it's it's saying as if COVID is still happening, and it is, and that's one thing I kind of want to stress. And at our institution, and I'm sure other institutions did the same thing, we found that we automatically were in transition into being our own self-sufficient unit. So we had our own testing from day one. We had our own quarantine isolation units. We started doing vaccinations as soon as possible because one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that our students who are here did not have to make that choice of going home if they could not. Uh, and so even if a student got sick, they had a choice to either go home to quarantine or they could stay on campus and seamlessly never even miss a day of class. Uh, we went straight from um, on person to being majority to I think 85% online, 15% hybrid. And most of these institutions do that and try to pivot. And that's very important for when you're picking a school and um, selecting an institution. It's harder for some bigger institutions to do that, but for some of the smaller ones, more personable ones, they are able um, to kind of do that, right? And so COVID shocked everybody. It changed any sector that you're working in or whatever. It was something brand new. Um, what you'll see now in our educational sector is that the online environment is not going to go away, right? So also looking at a school that can marry the two together, where it's on face and on ground, that gives you as a student a lot more flexibility so that you could possibly take two or three classes in the morning and then have two that are online. Let's say if you got to take a part-time job. Those are the kind of things that, um, that, that you also should probably look at when you're shopping for a school to see how strong is their instructional technology, how many classes do they have a hybrid, because that might be something that's appealing to you. I think everybody's become used to Zoom and WebEx and everything, so that might be also a, a new mode of learning that you might want to explore. So I just kind of wanted to mention that real quick. And I noticed that you said that, uh, you know, we're, we're addressing it as if the pandemic is still here, which we know it is, even though the numbers may be decreasing on COVID-19, but we know that the Delta uh, variant, I believe it's called, is out there and is uh, very aggressive. And I believe they said already in 49 of the 50 states. So I'm sure that you all have plans in place to address that should something happen again, similar to how it happened unexpectedly the beginning of last year. I know that one of the panelists has suggested that uh, as far as the scholarships that they have gone test optional. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask this question because I did see it in the chat regarding uh, those um, tests having to be taken in order to apply for scholarships. Was that you, Ms. Belcher? Yes, it was. So, and again, I can only speak for um, Stevenson and we are a little bit different because we are fully test blind. So we just are not looking at any tests for anything. Um, it really depends on the school. C uh, SU, we do not require uh, SAT or ACT scores for scholarships this year. Any of the other schools, are you uh, still uh, test optional when it comes to applying for your scholarships? Well, oh. I'm state, we are, um, that's the only thing that we still require students to have a test for is the um, scholarship. We don't have a huge scholarship budget. And if we take away the <laughs> test score, uh, option then that would just open up the pool and i mean we just couldn't handle the um the um the the, the need for scholarships in that case but what we also did as part of COVID is we uh, instituted our president's promise scholarship which we open up to our students who live outside the state of alabama that they can come to school and basically we'll take care of their out-of-state fee they meet our certain requirements so we did create a scholarship to help balance that out I saw that Ms. Walker was going to respond, and I also saw a comment from Ms. Boyd in the chat. So Ms. Walker and then Ms. Boyd, please. At Avery University, pre-COVID, um, we were already test optional. Um, so this year, we basically, um, as um, Mrs. Fletcher said, we kind of did away with testing. It will not affect our scholarships because our scholarships are really based upon GPA. Um, so the higher your GPA, the higher chance that you have of getting those top tier scholarships. Do I think we will go back to taking test scores? I'm pushing that we don't um, because okay. like he said from Alabama State, it does not make a difference between students letting us know how you tested based upon how you performed in your classes. 
Ms. Boyd? Yes, I, I was just primarily going to say almost the same thing, but just a little differently in that um, the test our, at Hampton, our test optional policy is being reinstated. We were test optional before the pandemic, and then we went to just um, not requiring them at all, all for the 21-22 academic year. Um, however, uh, we use test uh, um, t standardized tests now like uh, Alabama State does for scholarship purposes and that consideration. And we also, uh, so that parents and students will know, implemented additional scholarship opportunities that were not tied to test scores. And so this year we added the character scholarship, which is a $10,000 scholarship for students who demonstrated excellence in character. And all they had to do was submit an essay and have a strong letter of recommendation to be one of the candidates. We offered 100 of those this year. And we also implemented a new scholarship just based upon GPA alone, um, that's $7,500 for students. And so many of the schools, I think, try to have some type of balance um, with relying, having previously relied on test scores for uh, scholarship purposes. Uh, so we have now have a combination of both. All right, um, our next question. We realize college is not only a place where students can obtain an education, but it's also a place where they will begin to form lifelong friendships. In what ways, especially for our first year college students, uh, can they begin to form these formidable relationships in a distant learning environment? And what is your offices, uh, your office of student affairs or student life activities? How have they adapted to what we would say is the new normal during the pandemic? Well, I will attempt this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say last year, so my daughter actually was in at UNC Chapel Hill last year. And um, one of the ways that they engage students were through distant learning Zoom sessions that allowed students to have some of that face time that they would have normally gotten on campus in, in the clubs. Um, so they did that last year. This year, um, like many of the other universities um, that are represented on this panel, uh, we're gonna be back. Um, as a matter of fact, we're gonna be back as what we're saying normal um, in this new normal. Um, so we're we're encouraging um, our students um, that they will be able to have the full Carolina experience. So that means that our 800 plus um, clubs and organizations that are student led and run will be available. Um, our freshmen, as they come into freshman orientation week, will have the opportunity to meet um, these um, clubs and organizations and they will have an opportunity to sign up and engage. Also, you know, one of the great things about being um, a student at UNC is that you have this amazing opportunity to see some of these amazing football games and basketball games. Those activities will all be there. Um, you will be able to stand in line along with other students to get your Carolina and that school in Durham tickets. And you could watch them, you know, lose in basketball and football and whatever else sport there is out there. <laughs> Um, and and uh, what I also like about the uh, student run organization is that many of the students, if you don't find something that really matches your interest or fits something that you are excited about, that you're actually able to partner with other students and create your own student organization or student group. So, you know, those things are really important. I think my, my daughter, if she would tell you, she missed out on that the first year. And I think she's looking forward to having that experience come up this year. Okay. All right, we're getting ready. To, uh, another comment, I'm sorry. There's another one. I mean, and, and everybody, I think the students okay. really got robbed of their first year experience. And so two of the things that we did, uh, we bought a, we did concerts for them at the end of each semester. So at the end of the fall semester, we bought two chains, uh, who was a graduate of Alabama State. Uh, he came and performed for us uh, in the football stadium. We social distance, and we also live stream for those that did not come in person. Uh, they got an opportunity to participate in that as well. And then at the end of the spring, we bought Rick Ross, and so you know the students were very excited about that. I think they were more excited about Two Chains since he is a Hornet uh, than they were about Rick Ross. But we did have some opportunities to provide some something big for all of them for just being patient and being understanding about what was going on. Very interesting. 
Okay. Um, how do you decide what your major should be? You know, we come to school and we're not certain yet what we want to do, but what advice would you give as to how to decide your major and what resources do you have available that might help a student parlay a skill or an interest into a possible profession? Well, I guess I was, since I was hot on the mic, I'll go ahead and start again. Uh, one of the things I always encourage students to do is follow your passion, because if you're doing something in life that you like to do, you'll never work a day in your life. You'll have a career and something that you really are passionate about. So often you have parents pushing students to select a major because this is where the money is, or this is where the prestige is. And, you know, the student will come here and not really be happy. Uh, they tend not to do as well and not as be as focused on something that they're not interested in. So my piece of advice for that would be to make sure that they do something that they're passionate about. Uh, and the last one, um, I'm going to stop it at this one. I'll go to the what it says with the parents. How can your parents stay connected with scholars activities and ac academics and activities as they work to transition from being the primary point of contact for their now freshman student? Sometimes it's hard not to be a, a what do they call it, a helicopter parent. I kind of started out that way with my children. So. I, if I could jump in on that one, I think um, the best thing is the communication that is established between the parent and the student. Um, if you have a good relationship with your son or your daughter um, as they begin this process and you can um, at least give them a sense that you have confidence in their abilities to handle their business I think they will be able to then have that level of trust where they feel like they can share things without being criticized or without being um, hounded. Um, it's time, it, it is a time where um, they are have just as much anxiety as, as you probably have with this whole process. And so I think just opening the lines of communication, gathering the information um, together um, is a good way to kind of build that relationship and, and to kind of lead into that process of, of the parents letting go a little bit. Um, parents should also look to the schools to find out if they have communication portals for the parents where they're providing information. Um, many schools do, and that way you don't necessarily always have to go straight to your son or daughter for information, but you can look at what the university is providing for parents. And then, um, Lastly, my advice to parents is to also consider um, workshops that they may have on letting go um, because we are finding that parents are becoming much more engaged and involved in this process and it's 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 pre presenting some challenges for the students when they get to college and cannot function on their own. I mean, I've had students to come in my office two days after the parents have left and they are challenged about something and they was they'll say things like well i have my mom on my cell phone and she wants to talk to you and i'm thinking no i'm i, I you're in front of me so we're going to try to manage this and we're going to try to fix this and then you're going to call your parents back and say that we resolved this so um it is uh, you know if anything establishing that communication early on with the students that there is trust that they are able to handle their business they're going to make mistakes. We all did, we all do. Um, but it is about, it's a learning process. This is a learning community, a learning environment. Allow them the opportunity to do that. Okay. And so Ms. Boyd, we're gonna thank you for giving us that closing remark because our time is kind of uh, running out now. Uh, I am going to turn it over now for closing remarks by Ms. Sydney Hannah Holliday. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sydney Hannah Holliday. I'm the hashtag cap lead for Phi New Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And I wanna thank all of our fabulous panelists today. Thank you so much for your time and your uh, consistent and active engagement in this discussion and in the chat. I was reading the chat and, and learning a lot there. So thank you so much for that. So thank you, Ms. Angela Boyd from Hampton University, Dr. Maurice Farrell from North Carolina, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Ms. Mariah 
Walker from Abritz University, uh, Freddie Williams from Alabama State University, Ms. Morgan Belcher from Stevenson University, Dr. Giovanni Felix from North Carolina Central, and Jordan Fields uh, from the University of Maryland College Park. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, at this time, um, if we could, uh, I would like to direct you all to the survey. It will be up on the screen in just a moment, but I'm going to drop the link in the chat for you. This is a link to our survey via SurveyMonkey. If you would, please, you can take a moment now and click the link and go to the survey or you will also receive the survey um, via email along with links to the recording of today's session and links to sessions that have come before. So when you do the survey, also let us know if there are topics that you are interested in hearing about in the future or things that um, you wanna know more from us about hashtag CAP. And now I'll hand it over to Ms. Cassandra Shambliss and Ms. Kanisha Smith for our giveaways. I would like to thank everybody again for participating. Um, I apologize for not having the slides on the screen, but there's something that's happening to my sharing capacity. But we are going to pick some numbers for students from the registration list so that we can give away three $7.50 um, Chick-fil-A gift cards. So if your name is called, make sure that we have your address information so that we can mail these gift cards to you. Um, the first number that I will call will be number 34. Cassandra, could you tell me what student that is? Number 34 is Jasmine Brookins. Jasmine, if you are on the call, could you please list in the chat that you are here and we will connect with you to get your information or you can come off mute and let us know that you're here. I see that she said she's here. Um, so Jasmine will get the first gift card. Our next number is number 78. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, number 78 is Selena McCreer. Selena, are you here? Either in the chat or you can come off mute. Selena. Cassandra, do they have to be present to win? Do we need to pick another number? They have to be present to win. Okay, next Next on the list is um, Sharon Jackson. Sharon, are you here? Soror. She's a Soror? Yes. Okay, all right. Next on the list is Charmel Motley or Chandler Motley, Chandler Motley. Chandler, are you here? You can let us know in the chat or come off mute. Chandler is here. Okay. okay, so we will connect with you to get your contact information to mail you your gift card. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And the last number is number eight. All right, our eighth registrant is Carrie Artis. Carrie, are you here? I am here, but I am a soror from Chi Theta Omega, so I will go to the next person. All right. All right, next we have Buffy Williams. Buffy, are you here? Buffy is a soror. Okay. <laughs> All right, I will defer to Cornisha Washington. She's here. So we will connect with the three of you at the end of the webinar to ensure that we have addresses for all of you 
and I will put your gift cards in the mail to you. Thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you. Also, we have gifts for our panelists. Um, the gift is listed here. You will get a mug and a mask that lists the hashtag cat logo and the chapters involved in the collaboration. If you want your gift sent to any address other than your university address, please email me with that information and we will get it to you. Okay, Dr. Smith, um, does that conclude your part? If you want to go back, I think we were gonna discuss if there were certain questions in the chat that the panel might could answer. We will, this is Sydney's part and we will get to question and answers. So here you will find um, links to um, previous webinars facilitated by this group. And also you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, Invest in Others, where you will find um, webinars for the topics listed here. I think based upon the questions uh, that came through the chat today, I think a lot of great information will be found here for you. Are there any additional questions? I see that there's some questions in the chat. Brittany, would you be willing to ask some of these questions out loud so that the panelists can answer them? Of course, Dora Kanisha. So previously we had a question from a young lady about more information from any of the schools in their theatrical arts programs. So if anyone could give information on those type of programs, that would be beneficial. Did she want to, well, I put my, I just actually put my email address. Um, Alabama State University does have a theater arts program. I put my uh, email address fwilliams at alasu.edu in the chat. Uh, so she can email me uh, at that address and I'll be glad to get her all the information she needs. Also too, I put in the uh, chat, um, the website to uh, the dramatic um, art department here at UNC. It is a very robust um, art department that focuses not only on just drama, but performances, music, all of those things. And they have um, world renowned uh, faculty that need these uh, particular uh, studies. So I would encourage you to check out the website and, and see how that, if those things interest you and your willingness to come to UNC. And I will put my information um, in the chat as well for Avery. Um, for the art department. We do give out um, art scholarships. So um, that is a big plus, but I will put my information in there so she can connect with me. And I also responded to the request for information in the chat earlier. Thank you so much, panelists. Next, we had a question from a student that asked, how early is too early for applications for college? I threw this out there earlier. Um, most of our applications, especially for those of us who are on the common application, open August 1st. Um, most colleges, or I shouldn't say most colleges, a lot of colleges you cannot apply before August 1st of your senior year. So that may depend on the school, um, but August 1st is typically kind of like the first date. Um, and I also said that most um, scholarships are due uh, within that first half, so like the fall or winter um, from August to like December or January. At Avery University, we do roll on rolling admissions. So junior year, if you want to go ahead and apply, you can. Um, senior year, last semester, July now, if you want to apply, you definitely can. We will look at your application just like we looked at the previous ones that applied in January. Um, but if you are a junior and you do apply now, we will not make a decision until September. But that does not mean that you cannot go ahead and send in your transcripts and or test scores if you want so we can go ahead and have that stuff. So we will not have to bug you 50 million times trying to get that information from you. Can I also add to that question as well? Uh, let me just take that a step back. So preparation starts in the ninth grade. 
if you all are applying to colleges, you really need to be preparing yourself in the ninth grade for those students that are here in, uh, in that class category, because we look at your transcripts from the ninth, really through the 11th, as most of, uh, most of the colleges have uh, indicated, we really start admitting you as a junior uh, or going into your senior year. So we're looking at your, your transcript as a junior. So what you've done in the ninth grade, 10th grade and 11th grade will count. If you have a great senior year, that's wonderful, but everything that you've done from the ninth through the 11th will also affect your admission status and scholarship status. So take a step back and start preparing in the ninth grade. That was very insightful. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. Um, next question, how important is community service to the application process? So uh, I'll just jump in. In terms of community service, it's it's more of an indicator of how well-rounded you are as an individual. Um, it's it's you have to understand, and you're applying to institutions. We only have that piece of paper which you give us, right? So we have to do the best estimation of how good of a fit you will be at this institution. So your application process, your community service your essay, all those things give us the complete picture. So looking at an application of a student whose um, grades may be okay, um, but they weren't involved in any extracurricular activities, they didn't community service, you know, they didn't work um, part-time or anything. We're trying to kind of fill out like, what, what were they doing? You know, how involved and how well-rounded was this individual? You see an individual who their grades were pretty okay, but they had all the community service, they were working, they're a very well-rounded individual, that kind of piques our interest because coming to a, um, a collegiate atmosphere, you're going to have to do all of the balancing and the time management, and you'll probably be a better fit and be more prepared than someone who was just you know, doing the, the bare minimum. Uh, so community service does go a long way um, in terms of the, the overall formula when, look, when someone's looking at your application. Um, that's just an opinion that I've had from looking at some of the admissions applications. Can I share something as well? One of the things that I found, especially last semester, uh, is young ladies and young men on the call, if you have an aspiration of joining anybody's organization, uh, one of the things that we look at is community service. And I can't tell you the number of students that come into my office last semester going, I, I, I need, I, I want to play at JKA, I, I need my community service. I mean, well, the, the package is due in what, five days? <laughs> so, you know, that community service that you're doing now will count toward that application. So keep that in mind as well. We don't necessarily look at it for the admissions process, but every organization on campus uh, yeah, will need that information to know that you are community minded. Very important points, gentlemen. Next, is it too late for rising freshmen to get university scholarships? Let me jump in and say that at Hampton University, I currently actually have some funding available because of, of some of the late awards that I told you about earlier that we're implementing. So if there are students that are out there that are still considering uh, admission for the fall um, and are looking for some funding, I actually, for the first time in like forever, have some funds that are available. So I'm excited to share that. Um, I'll put my contact information in the chat. Um, I'll hop in here. Uh, so generally speaking for University of Maryland, it is too late as our scholarship shaping and reviews uh, begins when students actually apply for our early action deadline of November 1st. So uh, students, make sure you guys do your homework, you do your research and look at every university because each university is different in what they're actually giving. Okay, so there's going to be deadlines, there's going to be um, tight timelines on what's when stuff needs to be submitted and when you can actually be considered for certain things. So uh, make sure you guys are doing your research. So I know, like I said, speaking from Maryland's perspective only, um, you can only be considered for scholarships by applying for our early action deadline of November, of November 1st. Um, so the, generally our November 1st deadline is where you're going to have that best consideration for scholarships as well as special programs and admission to the university. So um, just make sure that you guys do your homework. I know some institutions operate on a rolling basis and some have actual set deadlines. So um, make sure you do your homework.
Okay, so we've heard about admissions. We've heard about community service. What about FAFSA? How important is the FAFSA application aspect? Well, now that's very important. Uh, our scholarship actually opens the same day as FAFSA opens, October 1 of every year, uh, the FAFSA application will open for students to submit that information. The early bird get the worm. Now, if you qualify for any federal financial aid, uh, at any point you can get it when you apply, but things like work study, uh, each school only get a small, a little amount of money for that. And so the faster you do that, if you qualify for it, that gives you the option to get everything that's available to you the earlier that you apply. Uh, most colleges, I'm sure most on this line, uh, will be glad to help walk you through that process, whether you come to Alabama State or whatever university you decide you, decide you want to attend, we will help you through that process. But it's very important. It opens October 1st. Make sure that you do that so that if you're selected for verification, you have time to get that information into the financial aid office so you can still be early. So the early bird get the warrant. October 1st, every year, that application is open. Mariah, you were going to say something? I, he said, summed it all up for me. October 1st, he, he did it all. And like he said, a lot of times, if you ask your admissions counselor, they will help you through the process and get you in contact with the right key person. So he was spot on with it. There's also a College Goal Sunday. That's like a, a national initiative um, that you could find uh, a school or institution around you. And it's basically a national initiative for you guys to really, I think it's like, uh, get all the, they actually assist you with the fast. So um, it's College Goal Sunday. I'll try to find a website to drop in the link, but that's a great resource to have. Could you say that again one more time, Mr. Felix? It's, it's called College Goal Sunday, and it's a national initiative um, where a lot of different organizations, they purposely on that day assist with um, the FAFSA process. Um, and there's, there should be one um, by every, it's really, it's like all these organizations across the nation. So you can find an organization that you can come in and for free, they'll help you fill out all that information. I'm gonna try to find the national link and drop it in the chat. Thank you so much. Next, we had a question emphasizing the pros and cons of the early applicants. Well, I don't see any cons. Um, early applications are good across the board. Uh, there are no cons to an early application. Now, uh, I know some students would like to take the test several times before they actually submit the application because schools will consider that. Uh, I know we don't. I mean, whenever you uh, meet the qualifications, complete the application, send in your information, and as your scores increase, if you take the SAT or S ACT, uh, just send in your updated scores and we'll just update your records. I wouldn't advise waiting um, so you can wait to get that full ride. If you already meet the qualifications for something, go ahead and apply. Uh, some institutions will uh, consider the new scores and bump you up. Um, others may not, but you know, bird in the hand, two in the bush. Yeah, to kind of piggyback off Mr. Williams, um, you know, we're the same way. So we are test optional and have been test optional, not previously, but for this, during COVID, we, we are test optional. So. Um, don't wait to send your scores. If you don't want to send your scores, you don't have to. But um, as I spoke about, our November 1st deadline is like, that's the bread and butter, as I call it. Like, that's yeah, best consideration for university. It's a consideration for all scholarships that we have that are applicable to you, um, along with all of our special programs and um, anything else that might be a part of that. So that's going to be the best consideration. Anything after that, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because you aren't getting that consideration for anything else. No scholarships, no special programs, no nothing. Um, so, you know, we take majority of our class from that early action deadline. So it's important to really, and that's why I said, do your research on every school because every school is different. So um, if, you know, if you can see those deadlines and you can have everything in by that November 1st deadline, make sure you submit it. And um, if you do have test scores, we do super score. So, you know, if you take a score later down the road, maybe even if it's after, you know, that this December or whenever it may be, November, Fill, you can still send those in and we'll still like we'll super score so we'll take whatever the, the you know those combined scores so um, just keep that in mind when actually sending in those applications last question do you all all offer early decision
camp um, does not, we offer early action and um, have we discussed the difference between the two? Early action is typically a non-binding process that allows students to apply early and receive a decision um, early on as well, but they do not have to commit to attend. Early decision typically requires uh, a commitment to attend that institution and then you typically have to withdraw your application from other schools. So early action is, is a, a wonderful option if you are shopping around. If you are truly committed to, you know, this is the one school you've wanted to go to since you came out of the womb, then go ahead and apply early decision. But early action gives you options. Thank you so much, panelists. Oh, did I have anybody else who needed to comment? Thank you so much, panelists, for your participation and your willingness to offer us this extended piece of information. Mrs. Bowers. So I was, this uh, again was about to put a thank you into the chat to the panelists. Again, we want to thank all of you all for your expert advice, for taking the time to participate in helping our students in the community and giving them information that will help guide them as they make one of the most important decisions of their lives. Uh, to our attendees, we thank you for your participation and thank you for your interest in our programs. If you have additional questions, you've been given information. Also, you can always look up an Alpha Kappa Alpha chapter in your area if you're interested in finding out more about our hashtag CAP programs. Even if you live far away um, and we're in the state of Virginia in Portsmouth, Virginia, a small town, if you have questions for us, just look up Gamma Delta Omega online and we'll be happy to assist you and answer you in any way. I did put in the chat to some of the attendees who had a question regarding service to the community and those service hours that might be needed. We have a lot of service opportunities that we would like to present to our young people. So again, if you're interested, because we have national targets, that means that they're implemented for any chapter in the United States, you're able to go up online and go ahead and contact a local chapter in your community. I hope we've been of assistance to you. We hope that you have gleaned some information from here. I know that I have, even though I'm certainly a college graduate, it's a whole lot here that I did not know. So again, we thank every one of you. And I think that just about uh, sums it up for us. We said from four o'clock to 5.30 and I'm looking at my watch and I believe it is 5.30 exactly. So thank you all. Those